Hello, everybody. Stoyan here, your host of Productivity Mastery, the podcast that's bringing you some of the most successful, accomplished, inspiring leaders from all across the globe. We're going to have a special episode today. Uh, this is actually the first episode, episode 108, 108 episode, of, in which I have the pleasure to welcome two guests, not one. Uh, <laughs> and I just couldn't separate these two gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> we had a we had a great a great great Zoom call last week, uh, and these two very very uh, inspiring entrepreneurs were kind enough to share their learnings and insights for the upcoming version of our book, Perform the Unsexy Truth About Startup Success is coming out in Spanish very soon. So we wanted to involve uh, founders who are Spanish-speaking founders uh, coming from uh, you know, South America, from Spain. And uh, I'm so happy, actually, I joined this call because some of the interviews, uh, Billy from our team is, is doing some of the interviews, but uh, I joined this call and we had this uh, horizon-expanding session together, talking about culture, talking about productivity, talking about entrepreneurship. And I couldn't uh, resist but invite both of them, not just one, to talk about these kind of topics. These guys are the founders of Skill Mapper on a way to transform the way we bridge education and uh, how did you guys say it, uh, employability. Uh, so I'm super, super excited to welcome you guys. How are you this morning, guys? Hi, Stoyan. Well, first of all, thanks for the invite. Very excited to be here. Uh, and yeah, very, very excited to you know just have a coffee and chat about everything, specifically about culture, which is like what we are, are trying to build from day one. And I'm very excited. Thank you. Victor, yeah, thanks for the invitation. Go. Yeah, we appreciate actually, yeah, it's true. We had a really good conversation last week. Uh, so yeah, I, I think we'll have the same and probably even more fun than, than last time. Yeah. We already have people tuning in. Um, so Marta is saying good morning, Stoyan, Mari, and Victor. I want to invite everyone who's uh, tuning in live. Uh, make sure to post your questions in the comment section. We would like to take some questions and, uh, of course, to address topics that are relevant for you, the audience. But um, I would like to start with a little bit about your story, guys. Uh, if you can give me some kind of a context of uh, what's your background, what was the reason you decided to start building Skill Mapper? Maybe starting with you, Mario. Yeah, sure. Thanks. So I'm Mario Calderon, the co-founder and CEO of Skill Mapper. And a bit of my background, trying to be uh, brief. Uh, I'm Peruvian myself. Uh, I studied my bachelor in Peru, born and raised there. And then, you know, I always had this kind of back to build an international career and had the chance and the fortune to go to Europe for the first time 13 years ago. And that's where I had um, a very nice experience doing a master's degree in the University of Groningen, in the Netherlands, and then continuing my master's degree in uh, Norway in uh, BI Norwegian Business School. And throughout this experience, you know, I love being an international community and I wanted to build an international career. And that's when I started applying to tech. Tech, as we know, is my passion. Uh, and I had the, the, the luck to, to land at Facebook. That was in 2012. Uh, and actually, you know, uh, I became the, one of the first Peruvian employees at Facebook. And that's where I built my career before Skill Mapper. Everything between operations, analytics, and also data science and product towards the end kind of built my foundation on what I, I used to call it kind of was like the best startup uh, school for me, uh, where I learned so much. Uh, and one of the things and kind of the passions, uh, and this is a bridge to Victor, is like, I love to train. I used to build this data and visualization trainings, trainings at Facebook. Uh, and one of the ones that I really love was uh, DataViz. And that's how I co-produced this uh, course with Crehana, one of the largest ed techs in Latin America on data visualization. And this experience really gave me the spark, you know, to be more involved in ed tech and to understand which could be the opportunities that will lay ahead, you know, in, in, in ed tech uh, for the coming years. Uh, and one of the things that started like creeping there was like how there was a big disconnection between education, especially traditional education, and what the digital market, right? And, and the whole job market. 
And that's how like, the idea of Skill Mapper started. Uh, long story short, I was doing a bootcamp in New York in 2019. And my project was like, hey, how can you connect uh, the online courses, the online space with the employment market? So that project was kind of the, the spark. And then in 2020 is where I met Victor in Paris, in France, two Peruvians in France. And then, you know, they, we start bouncing ideas. And this was the idea that kind of stick the most. And, and that's how we, we cut Skill Mapper last year. So, sounds like a love story. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It yeah. was a match. <laughs> <laughs> you swiped right, I can see. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we have more people tuning in. Actually, uh, some of the people who are who I met uh, recently at a conference in Slovenia, Podim, fantastic conference, great job, guys. Uh, so Navid is joining us, and he's always positive. Love this guy. So he says, keep rocking, Stoyan, and he's looking forward to to hearing from you guys. Uh, and he's wishing you all the best, Mario and Victor. He says that you're in safe hands with Stoyan. Well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> we'll see. So, Victor, your turn. Tell us about your story and how did you end up uh, in Paris meeting uh, your um, love? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. So, well, sometimes you're born with entrepreneurship and sometimes it gets you on the way. I, I think I'm in the second, the second path. Uh, but yeah, well, I'm an informatic engineer from Peru. Then I went out of Peru, uh, I, I went to Chile on, on 2011. And well, I, I used to work in Tata consultancy services, like big consultant, consultancy firm. Uh, and then I start working in, in the world of data, business intelligence, analytics. Uh, we, we, I, I start working in a lot of things related to, to data, data warehouses, like big architectures. And that's how then I finished in Latam Airlines, you know, the airline industry, it's always a little complex. Uh, but yeah, it was really something I, uh, I love, you know, in terms of data and the data visualization analytics. And then finally, I was missing like a piece uh, in terms of predicting data. And that's how I started the master's here in France of data science and business analytics. Uh, and then once I finished the, the master's, well, I uh, I had the, the really good idea of quitting my job just before the pandemic. I didn't know it was coming. Uh, and in this moment, actually, when I was looking for, for bigger opportunities, uh, I saw Peru was having some troubles in terms of data, uh, in terms of how to inform people and communicate uh, in, in, during the pandemic. So I started helping uh, proactively there. Uh, I did a couple of articles, and then uh, I co-found uh, an institution, an NGO called Open COVID Peru. And well, long story short, we became like the official reference of COVID in Peru. Uh, there was a big impact there. And because of this, actually, it's like Mario's uh, contacted me because of one of the articles. <clears throat> and then, well, yeah, we start with, uh, with the talks, and finally, we arrived to Skill Mapper. And today I'm in charge of all the technology side there. And also, yeah, like building culture from day one. It really sounds like a, like a founder love story, right? And, and since today we're going to be talking a lot about culture, something that you guys are really passionate about, I want to, if you can share a little bit about this kind of, uh, <clears throat> how did you know that I'm teaming up with the right person, right? That's something that, Many companies are failing because not because they don't have the you know the strengths and the skills to pull it off, but because they team up with people who are not on the same page, either with the vision, either they understand and see the world differently, they have different values. So, so I'm just wondering uh, how long did it take for you to to understand I uh, this this person and I we can really we can really work together for a long long time. Right, uh, a lot to unpack there. <laughs> I try to to break it down. I think like finding a co-founder is is very critical naturally for the 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 likelihood of success for any startup. Uh, for us, it wasn't it wasn't love at first sight. Let's say you know <laughs> there was like that first coffee where uh, you know Victor and I met. It was May twenty twenty, I think, and then it was like, hey, listen, let's grab a coffee and start walking because I love to walk and talk. Right? I mean, I think we see enough 
uh, for too long on, on chairs in front of our desk. So <laughs> Victor wasn't to, ready for that. Just to quote there, yeah, uh, we had a walk of three hours and a half in the middle of summer in Paris, and I was with shoes. I was not expecting that. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's that's also some of the things, right? Like you're pushing that person, you know, outside of the comfort zone. I mean, as cliche that might sound, and I was like, okay, you no, know, this guy's enduring. First time I meet him, and he's not complaining. So let's keep going. And and I start, you know, like we get to know each other, sharing our, our lives, our our dreams, our expectations, our experience, right? Because we were all both very aligned in terms of AI and data and how this will play such a fundamental role in the years to come. Uh, but one of the things that caught my attention there, and I think this is something that could be taken as a, as a, as a learning or lesson for other uh, entrepreneurs, is like we were very aligned in terms of like how we want to drive positive impact in society, right? Like, and this is something that I caught, caught my attention from early, early, the early um, hours talking to him and, 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 and caught my interest too. And the other thing that uh, also was very relevant is like, you know, I could share many ideas because I think contrary to, to Victor and what he said, like, I'm the wannabe entrepreneur forever, right? I was a wannabe entrepreneur until I became an entrepreneur, right? I'm telling you from early age when I was 15 years old. And one of the things that, you know, I walked through Victory was like the different ideas I had for the last 20 years, I like literally one by one. And I told you, you know, Victor, this was a terrible idea. And I figured out a couple of years later, but this is the one idea that I'm really bullish about, right? And I'm really bullish because these three and four different reasons. And then what he was doing, he was really trying to break it down, right? Does this make sense? Is this feasible? I mean, also from the technical point of view, can we deploy this and build this in a way that's scalable? You know, like all those intricacies were part of the conversation. And at that point, I was like, hmm, okay, this guy is really, you know, critical on the things I'm saying, which is great. This guy really understand what the vision of this. And also we're in a line in this thing that we believe, which is like, you know, doing the greatest good, which is driving impact society, you know? And the fact that we're both Peruvian, got the same age, you know? <laughs> And also had friends in common. Men, in, in a way for me, like, man, is this destiny? You know, we're meant to meet, you know, here in Paris in the summer and just build a company from now. I mean, listen, like, you know, you could believe in destiny and faith or whatever, but I don't know if I'm kind of agnostic, but, but that's a different story. But I, I thought there was something there, you know, there was something there and I decided to take the risk. And I also double check with friends in common. Hey, is this guy's good? You know, <laughs> like, is, is this guy like serious and, you know, like, uh, you know, you can trust and, and er all the reference, all the checks were good. So listen, we had the second, a second date. We have a second coffee meeting and I don't know, you can take it from there, Victor. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it was fun because when we talk after like a year about this situation, he told me, yeah, yes, to this, this, this person. And he told me and you and I said, like, I don't know, I just talked to you and I thought it was a good I, I, will, I would catch, you know, uh, yeah, I didn't exactly. ask anyone. You know, one, of, one of these moments uh, in a business perspective, it's like, uh, you know, th this is it. Yeah, this is him. but <laughs> exactly. But I remember one of the things that we had in that first conversation. And actually, uh, it, it's true. Like, uh, I try to destroy the idea. It's something that I always try to do to see if it's feasible to do. And actually, this particular one, I said, like, hey, uh, you know, it, uh, it's not possible, at least for me, it's not possible. Uh, and, and the thing that I remember he told me that day was like, hey, Victor, with this, we can also do a good impact. Mm -hmm. So I think that line got me. Uh, and that's why we're here. But, but yeah, and in terms of, of co-founding, you know, and finding a co-founder, I would say that normally, you know, in most of the relationships, uh, people talk, about building trust, you know, on the way. And for us, it's a little quite different. And also in, in the company, you know, in terms of culture, uh, we establish a line and from day one, people start already with some trust uh, with us. You know, there is a baseline of trust. So they don't start really from the bottom. They start like, let's say in the middle, you know, and they say, everybody has the same trust from day one. You know, and some people start getting more trust, of course, and some people start losing them. Uh, fortunately, uh, we didn't have anyone that is losing our trust. But what I'm trying to say is that we uh, we start from a good trust. You know, uh, I would say not from scratch, and from there it just kept growing. No, 
So I think that trust is something really, really important in terms of uh, building a, a relationship with our co-founder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and I love that you guys are touching uh, upon those topics. Uh, and, and I know many of the listeners are either aspiring entrepreneurs, uh, founders at the moment, and, and building trust, first of all, with your co-founders, but then uh, make it in a trusted environment for other people to decide to join you why should people join you right uh, if you are not able to provide especially early stage the salary or the benefits financially that a corporate a consulting company can provide them why should they join you right and and you guys have been able to attract great people to your team so maybe can you can you tell me why did you decide it is so important for us to prioritize and focus on culture from day one? Um, uh, oof, there are many ways to answer that one, but uh, let, let's let's break down a few. So if we are a startup and you are building, you know, the, those, those first little steps, you know that you are competing to attract talent, you know, you're talking about talent, and that was one interesting angle too, uh, with the Googles, the Microsoft, you know, the funks of the world and other very exciting startups that are, you know, like just building great products side to side. So uh, building a culture that it's, you know, founded in, in, in like three, four, five different values that, you know, are, are relevant for you. And, you know, also could be, you know, attractive, attractive to other uh, people out there. It's, it's been critical. And, and culture is something that really it's, it's kind of hard to control. But what happens is that it's, 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 it's a way that, in a way, you leave it, right? You transfer, in a way, your values. You transfer your day-to-day -day living into the, the people that are joining into a team. And ideally, as well, it helps you protect that environment for others to join that have their like, um, like, alike, right? In terms of, like, how they see it, like, day-to-day -day work, how they see it driving impact. And one of the things that I would like to call out in the way we shape that culture from, from day one is like that being mission driven, right? Many companies will tell you we're mission driven, but not all of them are, right? We really had that clear from day one, like every single person that joins this team and every single person that's leaving the skill mapper kind of culture has to be mission driven. And one of the things that in a way backs up this is that many, if not all of our, our, our teammates, you know, the mappers, as we call it, do have very strong connections with uh, nonprofit activities, right? And this is something that it's not that we are looking through the CVs and saying, hey, you know, do you have an NGO in your, in your checklist? No, it's not like that. It just happens, you know? And I think when Victor and I interview all the candidates and, and the later members, we, we felt that connection and we felt that these people are really here to build something like it's, that could be big, right? That could drive impact in, in society. And also one of the things that, that I mean, I, I heard about from Brian Chesky, you know, especially in the early days, it's all about uh, hiring missionaries and non-mercenaries. Uh, and, and, and I'm totally aligned with that. Uh, so just to wrap up, it's all about like finding people and, and being sure that you are, you know, on, like bullseye on the mission, then for us was all about having that impact in society through education and, and building that bridge between education and employability. And third, so about living your, your values as well, you know, who you are in a way is authentic. And that's also something that uh, people uh, and our, our mappers appreciate. So. Um... What do you think, Victor? <laughs> No, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Cover most of the points, so I, I validate that. Uh, but yeah, like, uh, you know, th this thing, for example, of people doing like no profit activities, it it's a pattern we saw by accident after, you know, uh, we didn't notice. Uh, but it's true, like in every meeting, for example, that we have with all the team, you know, every uh, week and a half, we show like the mission. Uh, they always also share a lot of ideas, you know, in terms of, of, of what could come later, what it doesn't work. You know, today, 
everybody would say, yeah, you guys are the, the, the co-founders, you know, so it's always what you guys decide. Well, not that much, you know, I can tell you today, there are things even in the, in the product or, or some colors or structures that sometimes I don't like, but the people likes it. So, so in those terms, it's much better. But yeah, it's it's a lot of mission driven. Uh, I, I would sum it up like there, you know, and uh, yeah, that, that, that's that's it. And when you say mission driven, do you do you think people that join your team join because of the specifics of the mission, specifically what this mission is about, or it's like we are creating positive impact and they're connected to this and they want to be part of something bigger. Or do you think that people actually attracted to solve specifically this problem? So, oh yeah, uh, I can cover it. I think, yeah. but uh, I, I would say both actually. Uh, there are some people that actually they are more related uh, to education and to what it's related to the ed tech. They have been really immersed in that world. Uh, we we are even letting some of them like to to talk to other companies or people to, to help, you know, in, in coaching. Uh, they are active, some, some of them in networks. Uh, on the contrary, there are some other teammates that actually, yeah, they are more focused in, in, in generating impact in a general way, you know? But at the end of the day, like, uh, they are mission-driven in terms of, of these two aspects that actually we, we cover, so, yeah. And, and and one thing to complement that story and is and and something that I remember telling with so much pride to the team is like, I mean I'm sure like many many team members and and I can call out one a few times that I receive inbox in in my LinkedIn you know people working in competitors asking if there's a chance to join the company like uh, and and that's something I, I'm literally quoting the mission you know literally understanding which are the problems that we're trying to solve and saying, hey, I mean, I know you guys might be tight on budget, but if there's any time, you know, a chance to, to join, you know, uh, these are my skill set and, and I would love to, to have a chat, you know, and, and, and that's what really, for me at least, is a testament that, that you are slowly by slowly building the right things and, and you are, you know, bullseye on the right, on, on the right mission and, and you having the right North Star out there. So, so that's that's something that really like you Mario, know when, when when you wake up every day you're like ah oh, man I'm doing something we might be doing something right. I'm getting goosebumps, man, and and <laughs> I'm so excited about the, uh, that you shared this because I I I think most people still think that oh yeah purpose and mission like the fluffy stuff yeah whatever but but it's so much more practical people don't get it. <laughs> It's, it is what yeah. drives you as a founder to wake up and go through the difficult days. It is what yeah. inspires people to join boards. It is what inspires people from the compet competitive comp competitors to, to write you and say, I want to join you guys. It's not it, It's not that you, I mean, I don't know, you may be very rich, right? I don't, it's probably not the, the paycheck <laughs> no. that excites them. <laughs> no, <laughs> not yet. Uh, but <laughs> it's but it's like, it's this, per like the book, right? Yeah. P stands yeah, yeah. for 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 purpose and values. This is the yes. this is the north star. This is the compass. When we have a mm -hmm. clearly defined calls and mission, and I'm gonna give one example, and we're gonna continue unpacking, going deeper into the rabbit hole. But uh, there's one yes. one example of a, um, another company that's very impact mission driven. Uh, it's called Plan A for the uh, Plan A for the Planet. And it's uh, the founder is this very inspiring lady, Lubomir Yordanova. She was on the podcast and, and, and she told me the same thing. They, they have a software that's very complex, the thing that they do. But at the end of the day, it's about combating climate change. She never talks about the product. She always talks about the purpose. She goes to conferences. She talks to employees. And I ask her about talent attraction. How do you, you guys are growing so fast. How do you find the right people? And she was like, we are very lucky that we don't have to look for people. We have a huge waiting list of top performers because they're connected to the purpose. And I'm like, wow, that is that is so good, right? So so I can see yeah. guys, you you are kind of yeah. hopefully people people who are listening who are building companies can can get 
excited about it and if they did not take the time it doesn't matter if you're early stage or later stage if you did not take the time to really define what what's the impact you're making what's the bigger purpose what's the why behind it and really living it now is the time to to take a step back and say hey what are we doing where are we going how do we make this world a better place how do we make sure we communicate it simply and efficiently as you guys do i love the the one sentence right you know br bridging the gap between education and employability boom <laughs> right like it's it's that is so easy so simple what what was yeah. really fascinating as well and by the way i want to i want to shout out to somebody else who's joining us on the live stream lola uh Villaro Yuste, she's saying, you guys rock the best co-founders ever. And there's the rocket emoticon, by the way, just to make sure that we yeah. <laughs> correct. Sending hard to Lola. I want to remind everybody who's listening live that you guys can post your questions in the comments and we'll try to get some questions. But but I'm getting back to the mission and purpose, okay? Um, something I found fascinating last week when we did the interview for the book was that you you talk a lot about not just hey, we have a mission, but um, practically you got to take the mission and break it into tangible goals, objectives, and, and, and areas of improvement. So, so can you maybe talk to me about that? How do we take this huge purpose and break it into achievable and attainable, attainable goals and, and objectives? Okay, so um, yes, I think what what helped us uh, in making it more concrete was like, you know, bridging the education and liability is huge, it's humongous, right? I mean, like you can start in so many uh, different, like you can have so many different starting points. But the one that we chose was the, the one that we believe had the largest impact, right? And for that, that for us was like online education and MOOCs, right? I mean, you might know the term, Massive online open courses. Uh, Coursera started back in 2012, and then you have Udemy, um, then you have edX and so on. So we saw so much inefficiencies in that system, especially in terms of search, right? So if we have to break down this huge problem, let's go where the people are already, you know, actively spending their time and their money and their hopes and fix that first. And that was- I, I want to stop you, I want to stop you for a second. Yeah. I want to stop you for a second because I think it's that's a really great point. Um, so, so you had this purpose, you have this problem you want to solve, and and you pause and you say, where can we have the biggest leverage? Can, can exactly. you tell me about this process? Did you did you talk to people? Did you have brainstorming sessions? How did you end up with the the one thing? Yeah. To build this product, I think everything starts anecdotally. And it's, it's about the problem that you found yourself. You have to relate to the problem, ideally, you know, as a founder. Uh, and for us, like uh, Victor and I, we've been studying online since Coursera, <laughs> 2012. I remember doing my first gamification course there. Uh, but then also I remember starting many courses and never finishing them, right? And, and, and then it's like, listen, is it all my fault, right? Is it me, like, really not devoting the time? Or maybe these courses are not as good as they claim to be. And that was the starting idea, right? And of course, and that's when, when Victor and I start talking and then we thought, hmm, you know, as there are so many more courses being pumped into the market because of the pandemic, everything exploded and people are going online more and more to study. And there's this huge shift. If we're gonna choose one part of the big problem to solve, let's go to the one that have the biggest impact. And of course, then you came a lot of interviews, market research, you know, like tons of tough design thinking sessions to understand how we can solve this in the most efficient way. And that was the first piece of this big puzzle. And I don't know if that answered the question, uh, Stoyan, but <clears throat> this is, I mean, I, I can go on and on, but that's just kind of like, like how we, we really uh, nail it down to the one single subset of the problem that will have the largest impact. And from that point, we start building other blocks, you know, that are coming in this very like integral and comprehensive solution that becomes Skill Mapper. I, I think this this is answering the question, uh, and it's uh, I 
you know, this podcast is about the audience, right? So to make mm. it very practical and very um, something they can they can take with them and then apply. That's that that's what uh, we are all here for, right? And, and, and I, I know it sounds like a common sense. Uh, you know, and I'm speaking now to the listener. I know it sounds like a common sense, but often we are so busy doing stuff that we don't actually prioritize taking a step back and really figuring out what's this one thing through research, through design thinking session. There's many ways to do it, but before even starting to go somewhere to to define what are the most important priorities. Right, so so I think it's really really important, and and maybe Victor, if you can take it from here, and 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 maybe in a practical sense, tell us, you know, okay, now we know what's the one thing, we know what's the mission, and uh, how do we, how do you guys set goals? Let's say, is that you have a yearly goals? Do you have like uh, quarterly objectives, methodology? What is the way you decide? This is what we do. This is the main priorities that will help you to stay focused on what matters most? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> it's quite an interesting question because w w one of the, I would say, more challenging things there is to engage people a lot to what they are building every day, you know? Uh, when they are just writing a line of code, when they are just building a test case, or when they are just preparing the next post to, to, to be exposed to the market, uh, but yeah, like uh, in terms of this challenge, uh, I would say like um, there is a way, you know, that, that we structure uh, always in terms of the vision, you know, as, as I said before, every meeting uh, we put the mission and from this mission, we establish different specific objectives, you know. Uh, we already have a big roadmap, uh, you know, for the next year and it's divided uh, in every quarter. Mm, and these particular objectives in every quarter, uh, we start dividing them in little, uh, we call them epics, you know, we work uh, with kind of agile methodology. And these epics are related to particular stories. So at the end of the day, we have registered everything, you know, and then when we do the start of the sprint, we, we work in, in two weeks sprints, uh, every sprint has an epic related. That means that any person in the team can see that the little thing that they are doing is engaged in one way or the other to the final vision, you know? We have this big tree and you can just map everything, you know? So at the end of the day, when someone asks like, hey, you know, what is the impact that we are going to have just changing a table in the database or adding this column? You know, it's related to this and it's because of this. So people engage a lot in those terms, you know. That's in the part of, of development, you know, and how they commit to the planning and the organization. On the other side, in terms of priorities, uh, we have this uh, methodology that, that we use where we estimate efforts, you know, and time uh, and, and the things that they have to do. But on the other side, we also have uh, an estimation and prioritization in terms of what is most the most important things for the business, you know, and not just for the business, but also for the reality of the company, uh, because it can be something really important for the business to sell something tomorrow. But actually, we need something, uh, I don't know, more that it's in the core of, of the of the architecture of the of the solution or it's something that it's going to help more with a particular university that we are building with. So we establish this prioritization and then we mix it with the technical part and see which is, which, which is the final order that we are going to use in terms of the, of, of the epics. No? And by, by the way, uh, those of you who are listening, if you cannot visualize this kind of thing uh, with the approval of these two gentlemen, uh, we were discussing that this is one of the things we would like to include in the upcoming Spanish version of the Perform book. So uh, you might be able to see visual representation in the book if you're speaking Spanish. But... Um, <laughs> You can also subscribe to Productivity Mastery Podcast on LinkedIn with the approval of this gentleman um, in a couple of weeks' time. You might be able to see a screenshot um, with how exactly does this thing look. 
uh, because uh, they showed it to me last week and it was like a honey in the jar for me. Like <laughs> somebody who's excited about productivity and team management, it was like, uh, tell me more, you know. It was it was really good, and and I and I think that's that's something that's this is what works for you guys, right? This is the way it really works for you. But I think it's it's also really important for everybody to understand there's no right and wrong. It's about how can we make it simple with the thing that we do, the team that we have, the profiles that we are, so we can actually follow through. But you gotta find a method. You gotta find something that you know. Maybe you have weekly meetings and daily calls and, and then you have some sort of a board in a software. It doesn't matter what it is. It just has to work for you. Um, so it, can you maybe talk to me about that? Like how often do you uh, have meetings on a practical standpoint? Like do you have founders meeting on a weekly basis? And, and how often do you talk to the team? Like do you have any specific setup or it's more like intuitive? No. Uh, so no, yeah, uh... So, so to rise to this, you know, uh, I, I'm probably with that, uh, you can complement it, Mario, but, you know, uh, I used to work a lot in process, you know, quality, and they saw this methodology, CMMI, ISOs, and something that I saw a lot uh, in, in my consultancy life was that most, one of the biggest problems that companies have is that they want to adapt uh, the company to the methodology. So they comply what with a methodology says. And that's not uh, the way, no? It should be the contrary. Actually, the methodology should, should be adapted to the reality of the company. And when you start doing that, actually, you just take out some of the things that methodology says. It's like, this is not applicable in my reality. This is not the way it should be. Actually, we should do it that, like this. Uh, and that's how we have adapted uh, different methodologies to our reality, no? To our, our reality in terms of international community, we have like uh, six different countries uh, in terms of culture in, in, in our company, and we, we adapt to this to, to this uh, reality. So, you know, once you have uh, once you have you adapt this, uh, then it's easy to work. You know, for example, we have a biweekly meeting. We call it la like that when where we show everything about the company to all of the team needs, everything, you know, from, I don't know, a strategic, business, marketing, uh, technology, everything to everything. It's like that. Uh, and this is the meeting where we show always the mission and the vision of the company um, every time, you know. Uh, and then, uh, for example, the other uh, uh, attitude that, that we got, the, the other way of, of, of working is that we do daily catch-ups. It's just 15 minutes to say uh, between the teams, like, hey, uh, I'm doing this. Uh, yesterday I did this. Uh, and even sometimes, you know, uh, one of the guys has a bad day. Uh, they have the costume now to say, hey, you know, yesterday I had a bad day. I stuck with this. Uh, but today my plan is to work on this, this, this. And this just indirectly, you know, it's unconsciously gives you like the set of goals that you have to work during the day. Uh, it's just really simple as that, you know. Uh, they have it really clear in that term per day. And with those two type of meetings, you know, uh, has been working good until now. Yeah, and, and just to complement there, uh, also they have one-on-ones naturally, you know, and uh, we direct uh, and also we we try to do like skip management at least once a month just to make sure that uh, we sense in the pulse of, of everybody in the team, making sure that uh, the work, uh, the load of the work is uh, bearable and, and they understand what they're doing, what they do on a daily basis. Uh, and also Victor and I have like a weekly of one hour where we go through all our you know, a list of, of pendings, <laughs> things to do, everything from taxes to uh, like investors meetings to, uh, I don't know, what we're we planning in terms of communication to the team. So this is definitely something that has helped us keep in a good rhythm and a good cadence. That said as well, and I feel many people like here that might be listening, it's it's tough, you know, like to, to sometimes make a call on where do you need a meeting or not. Sometimes it's a classic meme, you know, like this meeting could have been a mail, right? And that happens, you know, I mean, you always like 
uh, you you have the risk of of doing an over meeting culture. So always try to make sure that when you are planning meetings, you know, uh, you try to have an agenda or at least an objective for that meeting. That's one. And second of all, like if there's no reason to have like let's say a weekly, you can do it a bi-weekly or or remove the cadence. You know, so always make sure that the meetings are are built with a purpose. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we are perfect, by the way. It means that we're learning along the way. And we're always trying to improve and to understand, take a look back and say, hey, do we have the right cadence of meetings, of one-on-one -on -one points? If not, let's revise it and change it. I would imagine this is this is part of the weekly discussions to review the week in terms of not just the results and the projects, but also the processes. How, how do we do things? Do we over-meeting? Uh, or, or, or should we do any kind of changes? And hopefully those of you who are listening can also get inspired about that. Sounds like a common sense once again, but it's surprising how few companies actually have this frequency in that type of uh, processes and meetings. And, and I mean like review meetings, weekly meetings, daily stand-ups and so on. Ah, you know, we're very busy. Let's, let's talk next week. Yeah, but we're missing out. Like last week you said, next week <laughs> no yeah <laughs> because like uh, because we are so busy to do stuff but at the end of the day yeah. if we want to be productive long term we need to have these things we need to prioritize these type of meetings and discussions in communications um i've recently delivered my first tedx talk and when i was developing the the story the structure you know initially i wanted to talk about productivity and, and you know, how can we, can we get things done and achieve results? But but then I was like, we are kind of, as business leaders, you know, globally, like we, we kind of focus a lot on the productivity and the results and efficiency and those kind of things. What we are neglecting a little bit more is how do we create cultures that we care for the people as well, not just for the productivity, but make organizations where people are feeling fulfilled, they're feeling appreciated, they feel like my manager gives me a great set of priorities, objectives, I know why I'm here, like all those kind of things. Um, so, so that would be my question, or maybe like opening a discussion with you guys is, what do you think we can do better as leaders to create culture in our organization that's not only focused on results, productivity, and efficiency, but is putting people as a priority as well. Um, I can start there quickly. And I think picking up on what Victor said at the beginning, it's all about trust, right? It's all about trust. And, and, and if you build that trust from the beginning in, in the sense that a you know, teammate can tell you, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going through maybe like you know, a bad week. Right, as we say, and, and not being as productive, you know, like from the other side. I mean, like you, you as you could be a leader, you know, you can be a co-founder, but of, of course, you also have empathy, right? So having the trust and having that safe zone in which like people can open up and communicate how they're feeling, where they think they're doing like work that's driving impact, where they're overloaded with work, that's something that we make sure that we have installed like in, in the culture. So anyone from day one can be open and transparent in how they feel and whether they're, you know, uh, going through good patch or a bad patch. You know, that's that's one of the things that I think we we have, I would say, successfully installed, and and everybody's very open in terms of that. And and the other thing as well, uh, it's uh, I know this might be common sense, and I, you might have heard more about it, vulnerability, like um, even the us as co-founders, you know, it's it's. It's. I'm sure that this kind of this this kind of protectiveness that you want to build around you that you are you know like a robot that works in 24/7. But we're all humans, right? We have our good days and we have our very bad bad days when you are like just tired and you wish you know you can take a break, which we have to do from time to time because we are no machines. But also to to share that with the team openly. Hey, you know today is a bad day and have that vulnerability to do it, right? In that safe space that you built, I think are, are ways in which like leaders in, in startups where teams are small or, or not uh, can uh, 
just be more successful at driving that culture. So those are two that, that I can call out. Uh, yeah, well, um, something that, that we discussed also during last week, and I think it's quite related to this, is that I, I told you that I personally and professionally, uh, professionally uh, manage my life on three aspects. Uh, so it's love, communication, and respect, you know, and you can apply this to anything in your life, your personal or professional. And that's something that we also try to build in this space uh, and this culture, no love in everything that we do. Uh, so when you do something with that, you know, uh, you don't need someone telling you behind you, hey, is this is on or how is it or what's the status, you know? It's just you are doing it because you believe in that that you want to do it. Uh, respect for, for, for each other because you are not alone, you know, there is people around and also there is people depending on you, on the things that you are doing and communication that it's the base for everything that actually you have to be open, uh, we have to be coordinating in everything and we have also, the, as Mario said, the vulnerability to, to, to just say things, you know, even they are good or bad for the company, you know. We, we have gave freedom to people to say the things uh, open everything, you know, even when they don't like something uh, that it's uh, uh, that it's something not good for company, they are open to say it and we can discuss it because it's always a different point of view. And finally, uh, to close this, uh, something that I always say, say the guys when we are working uh, in the technology side is that I love uh, when they do mistakes, you know, uh, and they tell me like, but why, you know, and it's, because when you make a mistake, it means that actually you are risking something. You are trying to go farther or beyond something that you know, uh, and you are taking a risky path, you know, to achieve something, of course, better. So people always, you know, in, in some uh, particular environments, they are afraid of saying, hey, you know, I'm going to have a problem if I do this like this, or hey, I... Uh, delete the database by accident, and it happened, by the way. Uh, <laughs> we have some stories there, but, you know, when people is open and they just say, hey, you know, I screwed it here or I messed up here. Okay, let's fix it. Let's do the solution. Then we'll see how to change. You know? So those are the things that, that help us uh, uh, a lot in, in our daily work. Thank you guys um, for touching the, 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 the point on the vulnerability. And, yeah. and actually the, the, the fact that we should see it as a strength as opposed to, you know, I, if I'm sharing my mistake, then people will think I'm weak, right? Which which is a, mm -hmm. still a, like a, a way this is being taken in many in many places. Um, and I'm actually curious to, to hear, Mario, I, I know you wanted to kind of comment on something. Maybe you can do that. And, but I'm curious to hear also, um, you know, Victor, you mentioned, hey, we we do you know we do make mistakes and and if you can share some of your f ups um because you know people are listening right now and they're like um wow these guys are building something amazing great purpose very efficient and they kind of we create this kind of picture that everything goes smooth and you know no. we are these superhumans <laughs> so so maybe uh, can you can you talk to me about uh, mistakes and you know you know, give me a couple of examples of something that uh, you know was a major f up, and 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 what do you do really when, when you go through challenges and when you fail big time? What do you do, guys? How do you get back on 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 track? Uh, so yeah, two questions there, right? So in terms of mistakes. I mean, I don't know if we can go in, into particular. Uh, I will see if I can find an example. Maybe Victor can ship in later. Uh, but some of the things that we currently always do is estimation. <laughs> you know, like, hey, you know, it will take like one month to, to be out. We're so overconfident sometimes in our ability to, to, to execute. And what you plan, it will take one month. And you tell everybody, hey, in one month, we're going to be out. It takes one month and a half of two months. So... That's maybe, let's say, a constant mistake on estimation, right? It hasn't been fatal as of now, <laughs> which is great. That's why we're here. Uh, but that's something where we always 
uh, tend to 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 not go out, doesn't go as smooth. Uh, I think that uh, maybe you know, and it was more a matter of like the 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 context is like working with sometimes uh, third party developers. Nothing that necessarily you know it's 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 wrong because you know because of the context, many startups you know don't have perhaps the the whole full stack team, and they have to rely on outsourcing. But definitely, it's something that you know looking backwards. Right, it was like, why did we do that? You know, we should have like, you know, like spent more time trying to, you know, hire that 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 engineer that we were missing and build it on our own, because at the end of the day, you have to rebuild a lot of the components, you know, that that were like legacy, and it's more work after. So that's again not necessarily a mistake, but something that we have to look back. We we should have done different because it delays a lot of of, of the pace. And to your second point, and I'm sure Victor has a few examples here of well, mistakes. Ah, one mistake that we just I can call it out: check out your taxes. You know, from early days, like all that admin stuff and accounting stuff. Please, if you are listening to this, and I'm sure you open, you know, your company. It doesn't matter where in the European Union or in you know Latin America or the US. Make sure to just save every single receipt. You know, like be super organized. Because later on, these kind of things come uh, here to, to bite you, you know? Again, nothing fatal in our case, but it's a common mistake that many startups have, and we have done it, of not being super diligent. A few things that we miss here and there that can, um, you know, cause a bit of trouble or hassle, you know, later on. And in terms of overcoming, uh, it's all about, like, you know, looking back, understanding what was the root cause of the problem. And trying to fix it moving forward. There's there's no point of like you know lamenting or like hey why did we do that you know it's it's already done so so learn you know you live and you learn as they say yeah uh, well probably to complement a bit there uh, uh, yeah in terms of the technological aspects we we have we, we we did some mistakes you know I'm sure some of the guys that are listening now are laughing uh, but. Again, like based on what I answered before, uh, I, I invite them to do mistakes, you know, and one of the things that people normally do is having fear and when you don't say anything, then the problem gets bigger. So actually, once the mistake happens, at least in, in our in our culture, in Steam Mapper, it's like, okay, we say we have this problem. Okay, how do we fix it? We all involved. We don't care who was uh, the fault. We just try to fix it. And then, of course, we revise, you know, at the end of the week and everything, what what are the things that we could have done better, you know? Uh, normally, that, that's how uh, we work. I would say that in general now in the team, people is not afraid of making mistakes. Now they just say, hey, you know, I I mess up here. Uh, I need some help. And, and it happens. Yesterday, yesterday, we were launching some things and, you know, there were some errors that appeared. And, and the guy was not, uh, you know, feeling good. And I said, like, dude, it's okay. You know, it's part of life. Like, uh, that's it. You know, we should just keep moving. If Then we can cry all together if we fail, you know, but not today. So we just need to keep going. And in terms of probably mistakes, I would say, in terms of entrepreneurship or, or, or startups, you know, we have to stick to the... To, to the to the path that we are building you know we today we are having like a big debate for the last six months i would say if we should change from b2c to b2b like what are investors going to look more in us and you know we are sticking in, in this path even there were some people that i cannot go in details but uh that told us you know probably if we if you focus on this uh probably things would be better so why don't you do it and the first thing we think you know inside is if i'm telling you based on this three that i talked before you know the vision the objectives the activities if i just comes one day and tell to the guys hey uh we're going to change this how would they feel though no? they will be unmotivated they will say hey you were telling me that this was the goal this was the objective so if we are going, if we are making a mistake today, uh, I would say that we will keep doing it uh, as we said, and we will learn from it later. 
But yeah, there are some mistakes that you can fix and some that you will just have to live with them. I, I just love it, man. Um, as long as you are very clear, what's the purpose, what's the vision, what's the values, what do yeah. we stand for? This is your compass. I, I yeah. interviewed on this podcast the founder of the sneakers company, Reebok. Um, by the way, everybody should listen to this episode. The story of the guys is exceptional. But um, at some point at the at the podcast, he he was like, he was addressing the listeners and he was like, don't listen to too much advice. No, don't listen yeah. even to me. Just, just believe in yourself. B believe in yourself. Believe in what you do. Believe in the direction. There will be plenty of people that will give you advice, but it needs to go through your filter and see if that, if that, is that advice aligned with, you know, do I feel that this is the right thing? And, and so, so it's, it's a very tiny kind of a, you know, because you want to get advice, you want to be open-minded, but you want to also, no matter if advice is coming from Mark Zuckerberg and, and Jeff Bezos, or like, is that the kind of this, this, I mean, maybe they'll, they'll make a decision this way, but if it's your company, would you do the same? Right? Like, Absolutely. is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a great point, Stoyan. In, in, in the part of advice, right? I think when you are early days, you sometimes overexpose yourself to advice. And I don't know if, if it has happened to, to other people out there. Is the fact that you feel that, I mean, it's everything should be taken with a grain of salt, right? Uh, it's good to have advice, but if you, for instance, pivot too much on that advice that's given to you, and especially when there are sometimes no patterns even, right? You can be in the middle of a storm and be moving around and shaking and, and trying to change your north. So uh, for any startup founder out there, it's it's always, you know, like, it's good to have advice, but be cautious on the amount and be cautious on the, on the time you spend, you know, receiving that advice. And to always get that instinct, that gut feeling of you, why you started, you know, go back to the why and see where that advice is moving some of those foundations, you know, and if it's, if it's shaking it for the right or for the wrong reasons. Yeah, I would say that, well, today also that the way we have grown, you know, we, we have quite a, let's say a, a quite dynamic uh, culture and, and structure but the way that we have grown in case we need to change, you know, that that happens a lot in startups and entrepreneurship, uh, we are ready for it, you know. Uh, e even in, in the technological side, we are prepared to change things in case we need to because it happens, you know. And sometimes one of the big failures in general in, in, general in, in startups around the world is that the capacity of reaction uh, is not that fast. And something that we ensure today uh, in general is that we need to adapt and change fast and, and we have the capability to do it, you know, since they were, because we have prepared for that. Yeah, it's not by accident or because we are good. It takes a lot of time, uh, but that's something really important, you know, to be ready to change fast and, and yeah. Love it. So, hey, guys, those who are listening, be ready to change fast, be adaptable. Have There was this kind of a, a phrase, I don't know where it comes from, have goals, but write them with a pencil, right? So, so you can always, mm. you know, at any okay. point, you can always kind of adapt and things are happening yeah. every day, right? And yeah. um, my, my final question for today is, you guys are coming from South America, operating in Europe, and many of the listeners are actually based in Central Eastern Europe, and they're entrepreneurs. So, so I wonder, what, what for you are some of the kind of the strengths, the 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 things that you learn in South America that you apply very well in entrepreneurship that you can share with us? So maybe if you can take turns, starting with you, Mario, and then Victor, it would be fantastic. This is a great question, and I think something we definitely can share yeah. something with, with with listeners. I mean, South America. We, I think I, I share with you maybe this phrase: we we squeeze water from rocks. Literally, it's about being resourceful. You know, like you have so little, and you have to do so much. 
So it's in our that, culture, yeah. Yeah, it's in our culture. You know, you have to be so disciplined. You know, I think one one, one way in which which uh, I say this when I meet uh, someone new is like, you know, when I was a kid, you know, I had everything I needed, but then I, I didn't have everything I wanted. You know, uh, and that's a very common thing in, in Latin America, I mean, where middle class are bringing. Uh, and I'm fortunate, you know, I had everything I needed. But with the little things that we have, we, we do as much as we can. And I think we share that maybe with some Eastern European folks that might be listening to this, right? Like, <laughs> exactly. You know, like, you need to do magic, right? You need to do magic and then show up every day, work hard, something as well Latin Americans do. And one thing that, a third one that I would love to call is be creative, like creativity is in our blood, for sure. Like because that's that's the thing of being um, operating in a con- context of constraints, right? And what happens when you have those constraints? You have to be creative in a way you you do things, you build things, uh, you come up with new things. And perhaps one of those skills that it's in a way underrated because it's so hard to measure, but but it's something that definitely distinct, distinguish our cultures and distinguish like Latin Americans and, and Peruvians. You know, we're very creative people and hardworking people. Yeah, probably to finish there, uh, as I was saying before also, uh, it's ad- ad- adapt, you no? Know? And as, as Mario said, when, when you adapt uh, in a reality where probably you don't have all the opportunities, where you don't have like... Uh, development uh, develop environment uh yeah these things of innovation and creativity starts uh growing and uh, and and you get all, all this way of doing also uh the the work hard uh it's something really important it's really important uh not just from from the objective but that's why when you believe in this like you just keep going and you know that you will have to make sacrifices and finally, also something that we have done a lot is that the way we had the opportunity, me and Mario, of, as he said, uh, having everything we need and, and developing and then coming here to, to, to Paris, uh, we, we want to give the opportunity to also other people. And that's why we, uh, uh, despite that we are here in Paris, we also work with a lot of people from Latin America and also other parts of the world. And what we do is to build these people uh, from scratch in some cases, you know? So it's people that we just see the full potential and then we start developing them here. So then they can have the opportunities that, that we have today. So, yeah. yeah. Guys, thank That's you so good. much for, for this super rich and insightful episode. Uh, I'm definitely going to re-listen to it uh, tomorrow morning and, and kind of reflect on all the learnings. Amazing. And uh, before we wrap it up, I, I would like you to share with the audience um, what is Skill Mapper at the end of the day? Uh, <laughs> who, yeah, we talk about the culture, we talk about these things, but but tell us, uh, tell us like, what is Skill Mapper? Who are the people that could benefit by using the product, uh, who is it for, and, and basically where can they find you? Right. So as we mentioned a few times, uh, well, you can go to skillmapper.com today, right? Uh, we are building the bridge between education and employability, and we're targeting young professionals. Anybody who's about to finish university is looking for his first job, his first or her first job and those who are in the early stage of the career and then constantly you know having the desire to upskill right so we're talking these days about life uh, long learning you know these, these journeys of constantly upskilling especially because one of the things that you might know is 80 percent of the jobs that currently exist won't be there in 2030 so how to have this constantly upskilling it's 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 more like a, a need for survival so at skill mapper you found a different set of solutions for you to find the best online education, courses, articles, videos. Uh, also, the best way to apply for new jobs because we have like a streamlined all the job application. And last but not least, a community, which is coming soon, Skill Mapper Life, a community of like-minded people who's in the search for upskilling will be there. And just to give you a, a glimpse of what this will look like in a few months, Imagine you are doing an online course, right? 
And what happens? You're alone uh, and likely you are never going to finish. In Skill Mapper Life, you will find people that are doing exactly the same course and they will be connecting in an environment of, of community in a life experience. So there are some of the benefits. Again, it's all about saving time and saving money and making sure you are getting the, the best preparation to, to land that drip job or con constantly upskilling in your life. I highly recommend everybody who's listening to go check out skillmapper.com. Um, check out what the guy is offering. I mean, you already listened to all the great stuff they do. And uh, to finally wrap up the whole thing, I'll give the word to Victor to just, uh, what would be your final words to, to the listeners, to the entrepreneurs out there hustling to build their product? What would be the final message? Uh, estimate well. <laughs> no, but uh, in general, like, you know, when you have a dream, uh, you just need to go for it. And, and putting this in reality is that, you know, me and Mario, we used to have a lot of things, you know, the, the regular job and everything. And it's quite scary to, to do that jump, you know. Uh, but once you jump, every day worth it, you know. So I invite everyone that has a dream or that wants to do something that you can just do it. And in the way, uh, it's going to be tough, you know, but you will enjoy a lot and you will learn a lot. And when you are following that path, you will always find people that will help you. They are going to be around. So, yes. so yeah. Yes. It's contagious. It's contagious. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so you guys keep going. You guys keep going, and uh, and I just <laughs> want to say thank you once again for for our fantastic guest today. Keep hustling, guys. Keep um, really building something that will have a major positive impact. And uh, to the audience, to the listeners, thank you so much for being with us more than an hour listening to this episode. We really appreciate that. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to share it with a friend that will also get inspired. And uh, once again, this is episode. 108 meaning there's 107 more episodes so make sure to go to <laughs> apple Podcasts, spotify youtube and subscribe on your favorite platform we'll continue again with weekly podcasts with some of the most accomplished inspiring leaders out there thank you so much and have a great day keep performing ciao great thank you <laughs>